Okay. So I do record these Astro Beginners sessions and the recordings are all available on my YouTube channel, Owning Authenticity. Um, let me check if I have it pulled up still. I don't. Um, otherwise, I was totally going to put the link in there for you guys. But you can find the link on my website, owningauthenticity.com to get to my YouTube channel. So there's that. So uh, without further ado, I am going to share my screen. And do speaker view, I think is what that is. Let's just do that. Okay. And alrighty, so we are we are on. We are going. Welcome. Like I said, I appreciate you all being here at these Astro Beginner sessions. Uh, feel free to use the chat as we go. I try to keep an eye on it and then I'll pause for questions throughout as, as we go through the presentation. Um, I have just a couple things to get started with. Uh, my name is Carly Wharton and I am somewhat new to astrology but have somewhat of a passion for it. I connected with it right away and have had an absolute blast learning as I go and doing sessions like this are super fun for me because I get to continue to deepen my learning and my own thoughts about the subject of astrology. So all of that said, uh, my practice as a whole is located at owningauthenticity.com. I do a few different things along with these group sessions. I also offer one-on-one -on -one readings, uh, plus I do other types of events. And then I also do a podcast and put recordings on a YouTube channel, like I mentioned. So feel free to check that out if you are so inclined. As far as one-on-one -on -one sessions go, I am going uh, or am doing a April special um, for natal chart readings. So if you have been thinking about getting a one-on-one -on -one natal chart reading, this is definitely the time. So the prices are greatly reduced from normal prices. I also do host or uh, do offer a couple session. Um, so if that's something that you want to do, whether that's like a friend or a romantic partner, uh, those are super fun to be able to look at like, how are you guys similar? How are you pushing each other's buttons, energetically speaking? So those were, uh, those were probably my favorite to get to do, but just wanted to bring those up. So if you want to book an appointment, you can go to owningauthenticity.com. Quick shout out for an event that I'm hosting coming up on April 10th. Um, I'm actually, take that back, I'm not hosting it, I'm presenting at it. Um, it's hosted by Intro to Metaphysics Denver Meetup. Uh, my, kid, my friend Kendara runs that group and is having me present Astro 101. So we're going to do like an introduction to natal charts as a whole. Like in Astro Beginners, we've broken it down into like one chunk at a time. And Astro 101 is going to attempt to like skim the surface of all of it in two hours. So that's a lot to cover, but it'll be recorded and uh, that should be a lot of fun. So that again is going to be super beginner level. So if you have more advanced knowledge, uh, you may or may not learn something, but it should be fun either way. When, when is that Carly? That is on April 10th. That's a Saturday and it's 1 to 3 p.m. So coming up, I think, a couple weeks, week and a half. All righty. Any, any questions or thoughts before we get into this? This is more of a presentation where I'm going to share my research and my understanding. I will take questions in between each planet. So as we wrap up one planet, we'll stop for a brief discussion, but we will move on rather, you know, somewhat promptly so that we can stay on track and finish all the planets that we're going to go through this evening. So before we get into the planets, though, are there any questions or anything else you'd like me to address before we jump into this? Feel free to unmute yourself and talk to me. Cool. Okay. So like I said, we'll stop at the end of each planet. So if you have something, put it in the chat or feel free to pop on um, in between. So tonight's Astro Beginner session uh, is going to focus on the personal planets and social planets. Uh, and we will talk all about what all of that means. So 
for starters, uh, there are three personal planets. Technically, the sun and the moon are included in that as well. Uh, but the sun and the moon are technically luminaries. They're not planets. So Mercury, Venus, and Mars, those are the personal planets we'll cover today. And then Jupiter and Saturn are the two social planets. And then just for your reference, generational planets are the last three. So they kind of the sun, well, the moon moves the fastest. The sun takes a year to go around the zodiac. And then the, the personal planets are basically on track with the sun for the most part. And the social planets are moving way slower than that. And the generational planets are moving way slower than the social planets. So that's kind of how they get their distinct groupings is based on the speed that that planet is moving. So when we look at Mercury, Venus, Mars, they're moving about the same speed in the grand scheme of things. We're going to talk specifics here in a second. Um, generational planets, we're not going to cover those tonight. Those will be part of a future Astro Beginner session. Okay, so quick example. So this little chart over on the left that lists all the planets and their locations. So the way you would use that table to look at the chart wheel is like this example here where we see this little squiggly line in another squiggly line and it's at 23 degrees or whatever that means. And so now we look over here in the, in the table to find that same symbol. And so that's for Jupiter and we see that it's at 23 Taurus. The degrees are a way to further distinguish within each sign. Uh, so the degrees go from zero to 29.59, and these over on the right, keep losing my pointer, on the right side of the sign. So those are minutes and seconds. So degrees, minutes, seconds. Again, all just ways of being really specific about where that planet is within that particular sign. So as you're Googling, as you're doing your research, it doesn't really matter if it's at, you know, 23 degrees Taurus or zero degrees Taurus. Yes, there are levels that you could go that like really dig into the degrees, <laughs> that really dig into the degrees. Um, but for the, for the purpose of a beginner, uh, just being able to find out like, okay, this symbol is Jupiter, this is Taurus. So in my Google, I type Jupiter in Taurus, and now I'm reading about my chart. So that's as simple as it can be to get you started. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is you Google your placements or like your planets are, so Jupiter here is also in the first house. These triangle chunks are houses. The numbers around the center of the wheel are telling you which house you're looking at. And the last Astro Beginner session was um, over the 12 houses. So if you're curious about learning more about those 12 houses, by all means, check out the recording from last time. For the sake of today, I'll just say, you know, for each individual placement, it's good to Google both the sign, so like here, Jupiter in Taurus, and also the house, Jupiter in the first house. So those would be two separate Googles and two separate, you know, sets of research that you would do and then put those stories together to say, okay, what is your specific Jupiter energy? It's going to be a combination of Taurus and the first house. And sometimes you get lucky where you find combination articles like that, where it's talking about specifically Jupiter and Taurus in the first house, a lot of times you've got to look it up separately and then put it together yourself or work with your astrologer friend to help you do that. Um, but that's the idea. Okay, so the first personal planet that we are going to talk about is Mercury. Um, we covered in the, we covered in the second Astro Beginner session that, oh my God, sorry guys, the, the waiting room keeps being populated, so that's fine. Okay, um, so the second Astro Beginner session was over the 12 zodiac archetypes, so in that we did deep dives into all 12 zodiac signs, so Gemini and Virgo, we talked about those uh, in detail and that their ruling planet is Mercury, um, so Gemini rules the third house, Virgo rules the sixth house. So by extension, Mercury has a lot in common with those two houses. So some quick 
facts first about Mercury. Uh, it is one of the faster moving planets, actually the fastest moving planet because it spends 15 to 60 days per sign. So that depends on retrograde. Um, so if it doesn't go retrograde, it moves through a sign very quickly. If it does do retrograde within a sign, like it could spend, you know, a whole time moving through a sign and then go all the way back and then go all the way forward. Um, so, which seems more like 45 days now that I think about it, but anyway, um, it goes, Mercury goes retrograde the most often. It is retrograding three to four times a year and then like 20 days at a time. So retrograde is something that we can see for each planet. Carly, could you explain retrograde yes, to I, this beginner? Yes. Um, so I was going to go back a slide to show you. You can see which planets were retrograde when you were born by looking at the table that we were just looking at. This lowercase r out to the right side shows which planets were retrograde at the time of your birth. So that's something interesting because what I've studied about Mercury retrograde, like this is, this, this is my chart. So I was born during Mercury retrograde. And what I've read about, like if you're born during the retrograde, you feel better when that planet is retrograde. Like you feel more aligned, you feel clearer, you feel like this is how it's supposed to be because that was the energy when you were born. It feels kind of like a homecoming. So that's why it's good to know if the planet was retrograde or not in your particular chart. And the retrograde effect is kind of, you know, it depends on the planet and what the planet stands for, but basically that energy becomes scrambled. It becomes tense, there's pressure, there's agitation, there's all kinds of tension that seems to rise to the surface. And that's what's really cool about retrogrades is that on the surface, they tend to really piss people off because it scrambles the energy. But what it's doing is bringing everything that's been dormant inside of us, it brings that to the surface where we can actually deal with it, where we manifest it, we acknowledge it, we own it, we work through it, we process it, hopefully we heal it and we let it go. And so there's huge transformation that's possible within a retrograde. It tends to be kind of an isolated time because of all that processing and reactionary, you know, we tend to be very sensitive to negativity during a retrograde, I think probably for any planet things just feel harder in a retrograde. So I think that that's because it's honestly a time that we really aren't supposed to be within our community and being super social. It's kind of a time to turn inward and focus on ourselves and realign our energy and redefine, are we on track with what we're trying to accomplish? And do we know what that is? And are we headed in the right direction? And kind of a like a check-in with ourselves during that retrograde energy. And I, I feel like if we're doing that, you know, we don't have all the struggles that we have when we're trying to work with other people and communicate with other people. Um, Cause yeah, like it just tends to scramble the energy. So I can talk just a little bit on each planet, how I think that that might look when it retrogrades because they all, they all have their own retrograde schedule. So that's included for each of them. Kitty, is that, do you have follow-up questions to that? What does retrograde itself mean? Mm. How do I know if something is in retrograde? You let the astrologers tell you, is how I would put it. But the, okay, so it's technically an optical illusion. So the way that the sun is at the center of our solar system, and now every other planet, like all the planets in our solar system are orbiting around the sun at various speeds, various distances from the sun. In the sky, like when you are on earth and you look at the planet, it looks like it's moving backwards in the sky, as opposed to direct motion or normal is that it looks like it's moving forwards. So all of that has to do with where the earth is in relation to where 
that planet is. So it looks like it's going backwards, but it's really not. But yeah. Okay, thank you. I've heard that words many times, but I don't have an intellectual application for it. It, it <laughs> so looks like it's going. My yes, it looks like it's going backwards. Um, is my best understanding of it. I know you can technically like really read about what retrograde means, like from a yeah. You can you can get into the details. I personally have not. Um, I understand the energetic consequences that it does something like when when the earth and that planet are in that kind of position it does something to that planet's influence on the earth it causes a distortion in the energetic influence of the planet on the earth so that i get and so that i can talk about as we go through each um each planet so okay that that hit it thank you okay so mercury retrogrades the most and again that's probably why it gets such a bad rap that like if things aren't going your way you're like what is it mercury retrograde like that's that's kind of a thing um oh my gosh um but it's only for 20 days at a time that's also the shortest retrograde period that we see um and then Mercury return just means how long does it take for the planet to get back to where it was at the, at the position when you were born. So return, like it's returned to where it is in your natal chart. And if you have your transits turned on or you can see your natal positions and the transits, then Mercury in transit will be exactly where your Mercury is. That's what a return means. And so Mercury makes a full lap around the zodiac and comes back once per year. So these personal planets, the ones that are very close to the sun, our solar return is our birthday. So like we're having a solar return once a year. These planets, basically the same. Mars is a tiny bit slower, but basically the same. Um, so that means that like within even the people that are your age, this is a personal planet. So if someone was born a few months after you, their Mercury is in a completely different sign. That means that their preferences for everything we're about to talk about are different. And that's why these personal planets are so influential because even within someone that was born like within a week or two of each other, it's possible for your these personal planets to be in different signs. Um, so yeah, it's it's very interesting to look at, you know, they say the the sun and the moon are the two most influential things in a natal chart, but these personal planets are a close second and not just the sign and the house that they're in, but also uh, the aspects coming off of each of the planets and basically aspects, meaning those lines in the center of your natal chart are the conversation that the planets are having with each other. So what is the conversation that Mercury is having with the rest of your chart? Who is telling your Mercury nice things? Which planets are bullying your Mercury and ridiculing your Mercury? That's totally possible. So it kind of all depends. And so as we talk about each planet, um, there's, a whole, there's a whole depth to each placement that we won't be able to cover unless we're looking at a particular natal chart. So that's where I really do recommend doing your own research into your chart or paying for a reading, whatever your preference is, totally possible to do your own Googling and learn quite a bit. So Mercury as a planet, um, I think my favorite way that I've heard it put is that Mercury takes things apart and puts them back together. So that's a very analytical, very like engineering kind of job and what it means in relationship to our thinking and our thoughts and the way we make sense of the world is that, think about it, like we are constantly, like literally all day, every day, being presented with new information all the time. Every, every time we turn our heads and look, we see something new that has to be integrated into ourself and our sense of the world and are there any perceived dangers do i need to take action of some kind we are constantly doing that in our minds without really realizing it and so mercury is that influence um 
taking things apart, putting things back together. As you're presented with new information, you're constantly taking apart your mind and putting it back together so that that new information fits into place. So with that in mind, Mercury is responsible for our thinking, the thoughts that we have, the types of thoughts that we have, um, and basically our communication style in general, like how we, how we take our unique thoughts, what those thoughts are, and then how we take those and turn them into spoken word. Um, our style of turning our thoughts into communicated messages. And I'll say that instead of spoken word, because some people's mercury is in such a predicament that writing is really their only option. Like speaking aloud is just not, can, it's, it's just not in your toolbox. And that's cool if you understand it and you know how to work around it and you can practice, you know, those kinds of coping mechanisms. Um, and typically people with those kinds of placements are phenomenal writers because they had to be. So communication, how are you getting your message across in day-to-day -day life typically? Um, analytical, because you are constantly taking apart your own thoughts and your own beliefs and putting things back together, even if you take it apart and put it back together exactly the same way, you choose not to change a thing, like that, that action of doing that is mercury. So if you think about it, like taking it apart and putting it back together exactly the same way, that's where you get into like anxiety and thought loops and obsessive thinking. So that's kind of the dark side of mercury. If your thoughts are like, can't shut them down, mercury probably has some tense aspects happening with it where there's just overload of that kind of energy and no release for it, um, like in a square or an opposition. Not that there's no release, but that like it, you're gonna get creative to be able to figure out what your unique release looks like. Um, so Mercury is also unemotional. Like Mercury is our thoughts. Like we as humans don't get to be unemotional. We have emotions, they exist elsewhere. Mercury's influence happens within our thinking brain, like our consciousness where our thoughts move through the brain and we observe them. Um, that's where it is an intellectual energy. It's also very curious in that regard. So like very much learning, like always wanting to be learning, always wanting, really enjoying the taking it apart and putting it back together. So constantly feeding new information into that and very, very observant of the, of the environment around you. And th that's, that's where you're getting the information to take things apart and put them back together. Um, and then speech, that's where, again, if you have really positive aspects with your mercury, your words flow, they're easy, you find them very eloquently, they just come together for you. And if you have hard aspects on your mercury, that can result in speech impediments like stutters or whatever the case is. So that's where, you know, that's a very interesting one to look at, Mercury. Our ability to take what's happening inside our minds and turn it into something that other people know about. Like that's communication. Um, and messenger of the gods, this is kind of the highest frequency of Mercury is that it exists in a purely energetic state where the gods can pass knowledge through this energy of Mercury. So Mercury rules Gemini and Virgo. Gemini and Virgo both are messengers of the gods in different ways. Um, Virgo is an earth sign where they're translating that into understanding the tasks and the, the pieces of the physical environment that need to come together. They're intuitive with that, they get it done. They, they can just see it where other people can't. And then with Gemini, they're translating it through more of like channeling, like literally receiving ideas into their mind that pop in there out of nowhere. They have no idea where that came from. They have never thought that before. It's unrelated to anything that they know, but that it feels right in the moment. That's like Gemini Mercury at its highest expression. So that's Mercury. I think that's a pretty good, uh, yeah, that's basically all that I have on my slide there. I'm going to stop sharing because it won't let me open the chat. 
with it on there. And I'm going to look at questions real quick. Yes, so Fedleen asked, Mercury return happens once a year. Is that a 12 month cycle based in which house it started? Yes. Um, so literally 365 days, basically. Uh, give or take, depending on the retrogrades, like if it's retrograding at a certain time, like it might, it might hit it in like, you know, 360 days and then retrograde past it and then come past it again. You might have your Mercury retrograde a couple times if it happens to retrograde like on your natal Mercury, if that makes sense. Um, and then the house is relevant, but also like it will come back to exactly where it was. Um, so like, let me go back to this one. So like in this case, like, well, Mercury is right here. So that means like at my Mercury return, Mercury in transit would literally be like in the same spot at 19 degrees Mercury. That would be my return. And returns generally have like a fade in and then like a peak and then a fade out. So depending on how fast the planet is moving, that could be like a couple weeks to like you know, if you have Pluto moving over something, it's going to be a couple of years that that fate is happening. So just kind of depends um, there. Vedic, what can you clarify your question on which house Mercury attains such virtue, messenger of the gods? What do you mean? I mean, if you're asking like which house is Mercury best like performing, um, it rules the third house and the sixth house is Virgo. Uh, the third house is Gemini. So I would imagine, see, I don't understand what that means. Um, yes, as MOG, yes, as messenger of God. Hmm. Um, but I would imagine when it's when Mercury's at home in the third or the sixth house, it's happiest, it's best able to channel its energy and its impulses for receiving those messages and acting upon them, either speaking them out loud or taking physical act action, depending on if it's Virgo or Gemini. Um, but I would imagine third and sixth house Mercury is probably the easiest flowing without looking at the aspects around it. Okay, cool. So we will move on to Venus. Alrighty, so Venus is also a personal planet. Venus rules Taurus and Libra. So Taurus's house is the second house and Libra is the seventh house. So Venus uh, fits in with both of those. And so as we talk about what Venus represents, uh, you'll see themes of both the second house and seventh house. So Venus is slightly slower than uh, Mercury, um, or sorry, yeah, slightly slower four to five weeks per sign, and then it only retrogrades once every two years. Um, but the retrograde is twice as long as Mercury, it's about 40 days at a time. So think about how rare that means it is to have Venus retrograde in your birth chart, as opposed to Mercury retrograde, where technically it's retrograde like 60 to 80 days a year, every single year. And with Venus, there are some years where there isn't even a retrograde period to be born under. So that's, if you have Venus retrograde, um, you know, it's more rare to be born on those ones that retrograde so infrequently. Um, Venus and Mars are some of the two least retrograde planets for whatever reason. Again, I don't, I choose not to delve into the astronomy side of it because that's just not my jam. Um, so Venus moves basically with the sun as well, uh, 
And so it's having a return once per year as well. And I did pay attention last year on my Venus return and I felt it, it was very nice. It was right around my birthday, um, I think like a couple weeks after and yeah, it was very enjoyable. Um, so I'm excited to pay attention this year. Fun day to look up, you know, we have our birthday and that's great and that's usually a good day for some people. Some people have traumatic birthdays. Uh, but there's all these other dates, like our Mercury return and our Venus return and our Mars return where we can, we can celebrate those, you know, like, just like we celebrate the sun part. So that's my choice is to have more good occasions than less. So Venus return once a year, highly recommend celebrating that it's a nice day. Um, and then Venus as a planet. So you think second house and that's values, like, what do you consider important? And when you think about Venus being the goddess of love and ruling romantic relationships, um, values play a big part in who is it that you're engaging in that romantic relationship with. Um, we, have, we all have standards. We all have expectations of some sort, um, however we choose to define those. And Venus can tell us a lot about those kinds of preferences. It also shows us how we take pleasure in the world, in ourselves, in life, in our partnerships, in our work. Um, it can say a lot about the way we seek pleasure in this world and also where we see beauty in it, the types of beauty that we see. Um, Venus also rules our aesthetic. So you think about aesthetics and I, I look at Taurus and Libra and I would say, you know, those are probably two of the most like, well, throw Leo in there and you have a solid trio of like the ones most concerned with physical appearances. Um, they just generally like a nice aesthetic. They like beauty to be able to look at that and to, you know, it's pleasing on the eye. That's, that's Taurus and Libra. Um, because it's ruling value and the second house, um, it also has to do with money and our relationship with money. So this is not necessarily the amount of money that we have, more so a deeper rooted sense of how much do we deserve money? And so when you think about that question, you know, like, it's easy to jump to the conclusion of, oh, I definitely deserve it, but like, you know, sit with it. And deep down, do you really think you deserve it? Or do you believe you have to earn it? And if you think you have to earn it, then I would say there's probably a hard aspect somewhere on your Venus. Um, so Venus also rules grace, charm, and beauty. Um, so like, basically, I mean, being able to charm people, to, to get them to fall in love with you. And so if you have a positively aspected Venus, people just generally find you attractive. They find you easy to look at and easy to listen to. And if you have a hard aspected Venus, chances are you probably don't think that you are beautiful. And because of that, you're seeing that reflected in the world around you. So a harsh aspect to Venus is typically teaching us that beauty is something that comes from inside of us and that it has nothing to do with our physical appearance anyway. It's something that like kind of shines outward from our heart and our energy. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of Venus's vibe is that, that essence of beauty, not necessarily any kind of physical standard. When I say gifts on here, I mean the style of gifts that you like to give and also the style of gifts that you like to receive. I think um, my Gemini Venus is kind of funny because I, I consider teaching people stuff to be giving them a present and I feel really happy about that. I really enjoy that. And also, likewise, I feel like people teaching me stuff is giving me a present. That's one of my favorite gifts to receive is knowledge that I find interesting. Um, so it, it can tell you a lot about the style of love and appreciation that you prefer. Like my love language is words of affirmation and that goes along hand in hand with my Venus and Gemini. So it again is very interesting to look at. Um, it also rules attachments of the heart. So Venus in general, because it represents love, it has to do with how our heart approaches 
anything that it is going to get involved in. So again, like, are there tons of walls and barriers around your heart? Maybe there's a harsh aspect to do with your Venus. If you give your heart away very easily, maybe your Venus is in the seventh house. Um, it's, there's all kinds of things that we can look at to, to help understand behavior patterns. And beyond understanding behavior patterns, we can decide if we like them or not. And if we don't, then we get to decide if we want to practice new ones. So uh, yeah, Venus is a very, very interesting one because it plays such a pivotal role in our relationships, both with you know, other people and ourselves and the physical world in terms of money and our possessions. There's a lot, definitely a lot going on with Venus. So there, I will stop and take questions if there are any. What if your Venus- a question. Yes, Kitty Jane, go ahead. Carly, by looking at our charts, how do we know if we're in a positive or a harsh aspect? So let me, I'll put it back on that slide with the example and then I'll share again. Okay. okay, so aspects are these lines in the center and that is the conversation that the planets are having with each other. And you also should have a table that looks somewhat like this, where it's showing like all of the different things. So like in this example, the sun and the moon have this little blue asterisk in there. And that means that the sun is sextile the moon. And you can read every single square just like that. So like right here, sun is conjunct Mercury. Sun is also conjunct Venus. You can read that aspect table like that. When I say, easy or hard aspects. The easy aspects are things like trines and sextiles, and generally they show up as blue lines on the chart. And then the hard aspects are the red lines, and those are things like squares or oppositions, um, sometimes conjunctions. Um, and so when I say hard energy, it just means that it tends to present pretty chaotically it can be difficult, it can feel overpowering, it can feel like the kind of energy that runs away from you where you're kind of a victim to it. Um, I personally believe that the hard aspects are some of our most powerful tools because they, excuse me, because they, they force us to be introspective, they force us to get control of ourselves and figure out like, who do I want to be like on purpose? Like I'm kind of tired of just letting my own energy yank me around. So I'm going to get deliberate about it and figure out like, okay, so how do I want to present myself? And the trick, especially with hard aspects is like the goal is to take the best of this one and the best of this one and to hold both of those things at the same time. And if you can do that, you've mastered the hard aspect. So like, for example, like you have, you know, Mars and North Node here is square, Mercury and Venus. So each of those is a different square. Like you can see the Mars squares here on the chart with Mercury and Venus. And so each of those is presenting an opportunity. Um, it's presenting a hurdle that I, I mean, this is my chart. I'm not going to naturally just get over that hurdle. It will be difficult until I learn how to do it. But when I learn how to do it, it will be one of my best skills to be able to do that, to be able to hold the best of this one and the best of this one. Like that's a skill that we practice and we learn throughout lifetimes. And that's how we build our energy. Um, that's how we really get to know ourselves. And that's how we evolve our soul is through hard aspects. Easy aspects are like cushions that help us have a nicer time and that help us help propel us forward. Um, so it's not the kind of thing where like you only want good aspects or you only want hard aspects. You kind of want some of both of them. Like 
you want the roller blades on because those give you a fast, fun ride, but you also want to wear the elbow pads and the knee pads and the helmet and take good care of yourself and make yourself have a nicer experience while you go in case those roller blades, like you fall on your ass and get, you know, road rash. But anyway, so that's, that's kind of a, an explanation of hard aspects. So I would say to look at like Venus, for example, I'm going to go in my table and I'm going to say, this is Venus right here. I'm going to look this way to find that, okay, it's conjunct with Mercury, it's conjunct with the sun. And then I'm also going to go down this way and say, okay, it's square with Mars and that's it. It's not talking to anything else. So then I can go into Google and say, okay, tell me about Venus square Mars and read about what does that mean? Um, and to understand these little aspect tables, I literally just go in here and Google um, aspects, aspect symbols, astrology. And then in the images, it, it gives you little tables that like it'll tell you what they all mean. Like this one is nice. So like that little blue asterisk is a sextile. And the degrees, like that's how it's getting that. That's what aspects are, they're angles. Um, so like oppositions, it just means that they're 180 degrees apart from each other, which means they're across the circle from each other. Um, if you have a sextile, it's 60 degrees. So that just means it's like this far apart. Um, so that's, that's a little bit about how aspects come together. And I am starting astro intermediates, uh, about partway through April. And I think, I think I have the first session, actually, no, I did the first two sessions are going to be as, uh, intro to aspects one and two. So we're going to spend some time really diving into aspects and how to read them in your chart and lots of examples and all kinds of good stuff. So that'll be later on in April as part of the Astro Intermediates course. Any other questions? Okay, and then Cindy asked, what if your Venus falls into the sign of Taurus? So Taurus, well, Venus rules Taurus, for one. So it's at home there. Um, also, that just kind of like puts stability into your preferences. Like, I would imagine that if your Venus is in Taurus, when you think about like what is appealing to you in a relationship, you're thinking like he has a good job. He is financially independent. He probably has his own house. He's shows up on time. He's like physically reliable and dependable and you trust him because he is consistent and proving that he is physically present, like present and able to be productive is how I would see that as opposed to like Taurus and Libra, which Taurus also rules Libra and it's also at home there. It'd be like, you really appreciate romantic gestures and like people who just shower you with affection and attention and they bring you a cupcake and they like, well, Taurus one probably likes that too. But um, yeah, so it's more the romantic side of love versus Taurus, I would say is more the long-term like, do you have money in the bank? Do you have like a retirement plan? Are you, how's, how's your retirement situation? Cause mine's covered, but is yours covered? Like, just like, you're going to make sure that like they're financially responsible and stable and that you care about stuff like that. And you know, that's, that's a pretty stable vibration for love to be at, you know, like not a whole lot of drama there because physical needs are taken care of. So I would imagine that's creating some stability in your energy overall. Which planets are enemies to each other? What if Venus is with one of those? I mean, enemy of Venus. So I don't like, I mean, I'm going to try to answer that question, but I don't consciously know the answer. But what's coming to mind, first of all, is Saturn. Saturn conjunct Venus or Saturn opposite Venus would be very interesting because Saturn is all about control and Venus is all about love. And yeah, that would, I think that would play out in an interesting way. Um, and in terms of the what if, I mean, if you have a hard aspect with Venus in terms of you got Chiron sitting right next to it, 
that's going to hurt that, you know, that's going to be painful or opposite it. Um, or you have Uranus conjunct Venus or Uranus opposite Venus. Those would be interesting where Uranus is going to want you to like be your individual self and, you know, stand out as your authentic self. And now Venus is your love life. And all of that being tied together sounds very um, interesting. So, yeah, I don't, I, I haven't come across like enemies I mean, there are planets that are more compatible with others, I would say, definitely. Um, is enemies like a thing in Vedic astrology? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that is, I mean, that would be fun for another day to dive into all of the Vedic explanations, because I'm very much talking from Western astrology, for those of you that know the difference. Um, okay. So... I think we're caught up on questions. Move back into the presentation here. I think we're doing pretty good on time. All right, next is Mars. So it does move just a little bit slower. Uh, it spends two months per sign. Um, and so that means that it doesn't return for two years. So every two years you have your Mars return. It also retrogrades uh, the least out of any planet, and that is because it retrogrades just slightly less frequent, frequently than Aries, or not Aries, Venus, and um, for 60 days at a time. So Mars is very interesting how it plays into our relationships because it very much, especially romantic relationships, or I mean, for that matter, anybody you're having sex with, um, Mars just adds an interesting element to basically everything because it is our raw self energy. So whether you're acting on that or not, it's occurring to you, the things that you want, like, and that is your passion, your desire, like we don't necessarily get to decide what our passion is or what our desires are or what turns us on that comes out of somewhere else and that's what mars is ruling is kind of that subconscious place that gives birth to our passions and our desires our animal instincts the stuff that we do without really thinking about it um it also is very much responsible for how we choose to assert ourselves. So like I said, like either you're holding that energy back or you're not, you're allowing it to flow. And that kind of depends on what sign and house your Mars is in. Um, and then Mars is also known as the God of war. And that is because like, when you think about it, like the only thing you're going to war about is something that you are extremely passionate about. Like wars are fought over very, very important matters. Um, the things that you really deeply care about, that's what Mars is ruling. And then also because it is our attack style and our defense strategy. And those two things are kind of like intertwined into one, one cohesive unit. And that's that Mars energy and what that's influencing. Um, and so you think about like Mars and Aries, for example, uh, which Mars rules Aries, so it's at home there. And you have someone who is very passionate, highly visibly passionate, very excitable, very enthusiastic as they go through their life. They're very, very quick to act on what they want. Like that Mars being at home in Aries is allowing it to flow pretty unrestricted. So they can even be impulsive because they don't slow down to think about anything because they just let that raw energy come through. Um, I also read that Mars is different than our sun because the sun is the will. It's our will of who we are. It's like us saying and deciding who we are. So in that sense, it's more of a creative energy, the sun. And Mars is a raw energy it's like just the essence of who we are and yeah i found that really fascinating so you think about like mars and aries and they are like classic war cry like going into battle screaming and then you think about like contrast that with if your mars is in pisces you, 
you're a lover, not a fighter. Like you're going to find a way to love your way out of the conflict instead of having to face it head on. Uh, chances are you're going to, your likely use of passive aggressive tones is going to skyrocket as opposed to Aries is going to be very direct um, in the way that they handle things. Mars and Pisces is going to skirt around it and try to find a roundabout way without having to actually address it. So where your Mars is, is it, it's a personal planet. It definitely impacts how you choose to be in your, in your life, how you choose to approach things and relate to other people. And whether or not you're allowing your Mars energy to flow, I think is going to play a big role in your overall happiness because that energy is coming from a place in your subconscious. It is at the core of who you are. It's something that's deeper than your conscious mind can even comprehend. And if you're holding that back, it is it stagnates your entire energy field. And so that's where if you have a harsh aspect with Mars, if it's got an opposite something, if it's square something, if it's conjunct Chiron or something like that, like it it can really affect how easily you're allowing that energy to move through you and how much you want to just deny it. And if you're denying your Mars energy, it's causing anxiety, it's causing depression, like it, Mars energy has to flow. So it's another really, really helpful one to understand. Um, it also kind of points to like, how much physical exercise do you need? Um, if you have Mars in Aries in the first house, especially right conjunct your ascendant, you are probably working out on a daily basis. Like you are exercising your muscles, you're lifting weights, you're using your physical body all the time. If you have Mars or if you have Mars in Pisces in the 12th house, I can tell you you're happy to sit still for like 12 hours out of the day. So again, it really helps us understand ourselves and our habits of behavior. Um, and our needs, you know, like the the Facebook meme that goes around that like we're basically houseplants with more complicated emotions. Like, yeah, basically, like how much physical exercise do you need? How much nature do you need? Like all of these kinds of things can be found in in these planets somewhere and mostly in our personal planet. So I think that's good for Mars. Do I have any questions on that? Nothing in the chat. I'll pause for any talking questions real quick so carly is mars the divine masculine yeah so okay uh, well not technically saturn is known okay. as the divine masculine and the father um, okay and we're going to talk about saturn but i could definitely see that where yeah like Mars is assertive and in its shadow side, even aggressive um, because it's willing to literally fight, physically fight for what it wants. And so mm -hmm. in that sense, I definitely think it has a masculine overtone. Um, and again, if you, then if you have your Mars in a water sign or in an earth sign, that is a feminine energy combined with a masculine energy. So now even your masculine energy is coming out in a feminine expression, which is weird. So like, it's a, it's a cool one to understand our Mars sign. Okay. Well, yeah. Cause it just sounded like the God of war and animal instincts and attack style and defense strategy that just, uh, yeah. Like Sounds very masculine. For sure. Yeah, well, in looking at what uh, Vedic is just saying, you know, uh, yeah, it's explained as the warrior. So, yeah, that just, I'm like, well, that kind of sounds like the, you know, divine mas masculine, or, you know, it's definitely makes me understand why it's so confusing for me combining and working as a whole with the divine feminine, I'm a Taurus, and the divine masculine and working with both of those energies and, and, and trying to have a symbiotic relationship with the two of them. Yeah. Um, that was my question. Okay. So to kind of tack on to what Vedic said in the chat, he said in Vedic, 
Mars is explained as a warrior and the general in the army. Um, and then in Western, yeah, I mean, I would say a lot of that. Um, just in general, the energy, the way I under, understand it energetically is like Mars flowing unfettered is an individual who is passionate about their own desire and allowing themselves to have what they want. All of that has come into alignment with Mars flowing in harmony. So that's a nice place to be. And I don't necessarily think that that is feminine or masculine. Um, I think either can do that. It's more free will at that point to say, are you going to let yourself have what you want? Are you going to run after what you want? Screaming a war cry of, I want this and I will fight to the death to have it. Do you believe in your passions like that? And, you know, that tends to be, I mean, maybe easier for men to fake, I think is maybe the best way I can put that. But like, even then, I think at the heart of things, women and men struggle with self-confidence. And that's really what it boils down to, I think is like, are you letting yourself have what you want? Kind of comes back to confidence and self-love. So yeah, I, I do think that Saturn is the, the moon is the divine feminine. Um, and then Saturn is the divine masculine and they rule opposite signs. See, people influenced with Mars cannot pretend they are direct. So yeah, I think being able to pretend or being direct and how much of a choice do you have in the matter, that's a huge Mars sign thing because I like my Mars is in Pisces and I mean, I can pretend. I can cover up my own will to put on a face to keep harmony in a situation and get an emotional strategic outcome that I want. Like that's Mars working on the underneath side, but my Mars is also in the 12th house. So that matters a lot. But if your Mars again is like first house or third house with your communication, your 10th house with your career, um, and it's in a sign where it's like, of like a fire sign where you're just charging forward. Um, yeah, like you're probably not going to have a whole lot of pause between having the rush of energy to say what you want and like you're already in the middle of saying what you want. So yeah, your Mars sign can can definitely show how how you approach expressing your own passion. I'll put it like that. How does Western describe Mars and Saturn together in the eighth? Okay, let's save that one for the end after I go through Saturn. And then if we have time, we'll come back to that one for sure. Because Mars and Saturn are related because I think, did I have that one there? I think I did. Yeah, I didn't go over. Okay, so Mars is the ruling planet of Aries, which rules the first house. Um, and then it's the ancient ruler of Scorpio. So ancient as in before they discovered Pluto, basically, because that's what took its place. Um, so in that way, Pluto and Mars both have relationship to the eighth house. Saturn, though, yeah, we'll have to come back to that, Vedic. I think Jupiter is next, and then we're going to go through Saturn. Okay, so social or transpersonal planets are what these are called. And there's two of them, Jupiter and Saturn. Jupiter, excuse me, rules the ninth house with Sagittarius and spends about one year per sign. So compare that to the personal planets where every month or two they're changing signs. So they're moving really quickly. So that means like if Jupiter is halfway through a sign when you're born, that means everybody six months before you and everybody six months after you also has Jupiter in that sign. So that's where it becomes a social planet. So like, you know, theoretically, everybody in your grade has Jupiter in the same sign. And that being said, the grade older than you has Jupiter in the sign before, the grade younger than you has Jupiter in the sign after. So even within generations, very quickly we evolve as a society, as people, as energy, um, because these planets are, 
are continuing to move. So Jupiter goes retrograde once every nine months and then is retrograde for up to four months at a time. Um, and then Jupiter return happens every 12 years since it's taking one year per sign to get through there. So Jupiter return, I'm so excited for my next one um, because Jupiter is one of the most beneficial planets. Um, it's the king of the gods because it's just awesome. It's ruling over everything that makes life easier. So Jupiter energy, there's plenty. There's plenty of everything. Because of that, it's a very optimistic energy, like a very, the more the merrier, there's plenty to go around. Oh yeah, like just sharing everything that they have, um, generosity on there. It also is everything to do with expansion and abundance um, and growth. It's the biggest planet. If you ever like look up the solar system, I didn't remember this from school, but like you look up all the little, like the little line of planets and it's all the little ones. And then there's Jupiter and it's like freaking huge. So it's the biggest planet, which is, you know, it's all of these things, the king of the gods. Um, it also speaks to our tolerance and like our ability to make nice with other people, basically. Um, our sense of humor, which kind of is a tool similar to that in our toolbox. So those are Jupiter kind of areas. And with that, you know, you think about like, if you have a positively aspected Jupiter and then social interactions get easier, you make other people feel more comfortable, um, you build relationships more easily, Optimism and humor are two really powerful tools in building relationships. So again, if you have a really positive Jupiter in your chart, that's a superpower. That's supercharging everything that it's touching and is a great resource for you to draw on any of those Jupiter transits that you're having. Um, but if you have a harshly aspected Jupiter, it's like, like you don't think you're worthy of these things. And that can be some of the hardest expressions is that, you know, basically you don't feel worthy. So anytime something good does happen, it just, it's like, you know, you manifest money and then you blow through the money and then you're broke again. Like that's kind of a harshly aspected Jupiter. And again, anytime you have a harshly aspected planet, there's a lesson there that we're learning and that is meant for our soul's evolution. And in that one, I would say it's that, you know, we learn that true wealth is a spiritual experience. It has nothing to do with money in the bank. Um, and that's why, you know, in terms of abundance and expansion, we're talking also not just about money and like growing our financial wealth, but also knowledge and growing our spiritual wealth. So, you know, Jupiter is the ruling planet of Sagittarius in the ninth house, which is all about higher education and international travel and understanding cultures and people. Um, religion and spirituality fall into this category. So when we think about all of this plenty and all of this abundance, you know, it's easy to think like, oh, that's where my piles of money are coming from. And it's like, especially if you have a harshly aspected Jupiter, chances are you're going to learn the lesson that abundance has nothing to do with money, that it's a mindset that we get to live in um, on the inside. So yeah, that's, that's, feel good about that. That's a good, good summary on Jupiter. I see I have a couple things in the chat. Okay, so Michelle, we did go through that. I, I don't mean to not answer your question, but I know. Oh, you're sorry about that. No, yeah, I can watch it. You're totally good. It's being recorded and it'll be in the, in the, recording on the YouTube channel. So I would say catch the answer to that there. I go through that in detail about aspects and how it's harsh or good or whatever. So feel free to look at that. And that um, Natalie did clarify also that there's red lines coming off of that placement in your chart. Chances are those are the harsh ones. So that's something to Google. And I go through earlier in the recording um, exactly how you can understand like what to Google. So also, okay. feel free to reach out to me if you watch that and it doesn't make sense. Just message me. We'll get it figured out. I heard somewhere that your twin flame or soulmate comes into your life when you experience Jupiter return. Is that true? What are your thoughts? Oh, man. I don't know. 
I've never heard that. Well, and here's the thing about twin flames and soulmates. They sound so like romantic, fairy tale, all of that. Those folks are responsible for our spiritual growth like no one else. You know, they push us and they challenge us and they reflect our shadow to us and they show us the pieces of ourselves that we didn't even know existed. Um, and so in that sense, I could totally believe it because, yeah, those kinds of relationships when you're making a soul level connection with people like that, they are definitely the birthplace of spiritual growth and expansion and abundance of self-knowledge, um, which can be painful to receive. So, yeah, I think Jupiter is... Jupiter doesn't necessarily promise happiness so much as it promises expansion. And if you can find happiness in expansion, then you're good to go. But expansion sometimes can be uncomfortable because that can look like letting go. It can look like making peace with things are not the way you thought they were, that you have to expand beyond your old beliefs and move on to new beliefs. And those, those transitions can be somewhat painful. Um, but Jupiter tends to deliver them in a way that feels nice is generally it's it's a beneficial planet very hard to deliver bad energy through there so i hope that helps but i haven't heard that specifically yeah cool okay let's see i think we got one more planet and then that should leave us with just a tiny bit of time at the end for discussion if there are any last questions so last planet is Saturn. Uh, Saturn is one of my favorites. Uh, it is also a social planet. It takes two and a half years to move through a sign. Uh, it retrogrades once a year for four and a half months at a time. And so we have our Saturn return every 29 years. So basically, I'm going to say like, two years before and like two to three years after we go through our Saturn return around the age of 29. And basically what that is um, at the far bottom right uh, is the word taskmaster. And at that Saturn return, it's like the taskmaster coming around and saying, are you doing your homework? Are you doing what you said you would do? Um, and so every 29 years, we have a status check-in with our Saturn, and it's, are we doing what we said we were going to come here and do? As, as humans, you know, we don't always remember that mission right off the bat. We have to have some experiences that points us back in the direction of what we came here to do. And sometimes we get lost and distracted in those experiences that we're having, and we get sidetracked over here and we're over here doing these things. So when Saturn return comes through, it tends to basically strip away anything that you're doing that is not working for you. Like anything that's standing in the way of you learning your divine lessons doesn't get to stay in your life. And that's Saturn's gift to you is that it cleans out anything that's standing in your way. So with that, I think, that's probably why Saturn is one of my favorites. I love to learn no matter what. And Saturn drives us to learn those lessons and doesn't allow us to make excuses when we're learning them very slowly, more slowly than we intended. Um, Saturn keeps us on track. So with that, like restriction, structure, limitation, ultimately all of those things. I loved how this one article put it. It was like, structure and limitation define your life like the things that we do the things that we don't do all of that is our identity and the way that we choose to limit ourselves is our identity and so saturn i mean when we think limitation we each get an idea in our mind about what that means and probably it's unique to us based on our saturn placement um, but ultimately we're learning self-control. We're learning that, you know, we had a mission when we incarnated into this life and we had an idea in mind about the purpose of what we were coming here to do. And Saturn keeps us on track to doing that, to heading in that direction. Um, and so when we think about self-control, it's like not, not for anybody else's rules, for our own benefit of like, we had a purpose, we had an agenda, and life is not infinite. Like our soul is infinite, you know, I believe our soul is eternal, but 
life itself in each lifetime is not infinite. So we have a finite amount of time to do what we came here to do. And if we're off over here, like dilly dallying around, not doing what we came here to do, then we're not living our soul's purpose. And so that self-control is ultimately to pull us back onto our soul's path. So when we think boundaries, again, nobody else is defining those boundaries. Like it's not society's boundaries. It's not anybody else's ideas of boundaries. It's your own. It's your own sense of what boundaries do I need in my life so that I stay healthy and happy and productive and moving in the direction that my soul wanted to come here for. And so I think that's where Saturn can receive some pushback from people is like, like literally get off me, like stop, like Saturn needs to quit trying to control me. But the thing is like, we put that there to like anchor ourselves into our soul's purpose. So it's, it's a outside influence from Saturn that we very much anticipated and were grateful that we would have to help us stay on track. So that's how I look at it. Um, and so with that, it's our sense of responsibility. And again, responsibility can get a really negative connotation when you think like that you're serving the man or whatever, or the government or your boss or your partner or whatever, that like you're responsible to other people. You're not, you're responsible to your own soul. You came here for a reason and Saturn is helping you to ensure that you stay responsible to your soul's ultimate purpose of what the reason was for you incarnating this time. So that is how I would define Saturn. Um, up here, up top, it is the ruling planet of Capricorn, which is in the 10th house, Capricorn. When I think of Capricorn, I think of building an empire and really building anything in the physical. And the 10th house is all about our career and our highest public achievement. And so again, Saturn is very much keeping us on track to achieve and fulfill what it was that we're coming here to do. And then also before we discovered Uranus, um, Saturn used to be the ruler of Aquarius. And that's interesting because Uranus definitely fits way better, I think, there but Aquarius is a fixed sign. It's an air sign, but it is fixed. And so the limitation and the structure and all of that and the sense of responsibility of Saturn definitely still mesh well uh, with the sign of Aquarius. Um, but the free thinking approach of Uranus, I think, is more the dominant influence there, but still makes sense how they came to that conclusion back in the day. Okay, so that is actually two seconds. I'm going to go through, I have two last little couple little slides and then I will open it up and we'll finish out with conversation. So I do a monthly spotlight sessions and for April and May, we are going to focus on the midheaven. So this is going to be um, a midheaven nadir astrology reading in small groups and the midheaven is our soul's work. So it very much goes along with the North Node, which is our soul's purpose. They work kind of hand in hand, so we'll talk about that. The opposite end of the MC is the IC or the Nadir, and so we'll talk about that as the opening of the fourth house and the influences of that as well. So if you would like to book that, um, you can go to my website, owningauthenticity.com to find the links there. Um, and so that should be a really good time. They're organized by, MC IC combinations. So like if you have a Gemini MC, you automatically have a Sagittarius IC. So like that is one combination. So if you come to that session, you'll meet other people who have that same soul's work, um, which I think is going to make for some fun conversations to compare and contrast based on the rest of the charts, um, how everybody is expressing that soul's work. So I think that could be really fun. Uh, last, a reminder, if you do want an individual chart reading, I am running my April specials, so feel free to take advantage of those. And that is all I have. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. We have 13 more minutes for questions and conversation. So I have a couple things, a couple things in the chat. Yeah, Vedic agrees, hard taskmaster. Natalyn says her Saturn return is coming up. I'm assuming that's your first one. Um, a judge, a teacher rewards and punishes according to the karma. Yes. Um, 
So one article that I was reading got into Saturn as the planet of karma, which is a very interesting deeper layer to get into as far as looking to the lessons that Saturn wanted you to learn to help understand the karma that you're bringing in with you um, so that you understand like, okay, so for example, um, I have Saturn in Sagittarius and one of the lower vibe expressions of Sagittarius is that you come across like a know-it-all and I absolutely have gotten that feedback and that reflection many times in my life that I sound like a know-it-all when I talk about stuff. And part of Saturn in Sagittarius for me was learning, A, when is it time to share my knowledge? Because not everybody needs a lesson on everything that I happen to know about. And B, how to present it in a way that's easy to hear and easy to listen to. So Saturn, I think, points to the energy that we intended to learn. And I think maybe that comes from mistakes that we've made in the past. Like we naturally fall into mistakes because we don't know. And so Saturn points to, okay, like you're not gonna make those mistakes anymore because you need to learn these lessons. You need to learn this energy in its highest frequency. So that's, that's kind of how I look at my Saturn. I've also heard said about Saturn that like, because it's doing its return at 29 years and then again at like 58 and on and on and on, um, that like, it's not one to ignore. Like it's, it's a very, very important one to kind of pay attention to like a lot, like frequently. Like, I mean, for me, Saturn in Sagittarius makes sense with learning about astrology and getting to talk about astrology and spirituality. And like, I feel like I engage my Saturn and Sagittarius in some form, like every day. And basically that if you invest in your Saturn, that Saturn invests in you. That like, if you're learning those lessons and you're acquiring that knowledge and you know how to use that energy at its highest frequency, that those skills, they pay off in your life. So it's an energy worth investing in, in and that's Saturn. Yeah, second Saturn return in about a year. And we've talked about that, which, I mean, I think you're in the, the upside of like it's approaching and probably already starting to feel it. And that's probably a lot why you're on this path and why you're gaining momentum right now to learn who you are and learn what you're doing and what makes sense for you and to fit, like orient yourself in your life, like on your soul's path. And all of that is the kind of work that if that's what you're already doing, when your Saturn return comes around, it's like a slingshot, like a boost of like extra power to help you move even further along that path. Um, sure hoping. <laughs> oh yeah. No, first I guarantee it. Um, it just, it brings things into focus. If you're already doing the work if you're already like acknowledging this stuff that energy it just like flings you forward um towards exactly where you're supposed to be exactly like puts you in the right situations where okay great you you know your saturn's in sagittarius you've learned that energy really well you're doing a great job now we're gonna through your saturn return we're gonna bring you opportunities to demonstrate those skills and have other people appreciate them so and now it's like you're being rewarded for having those skills and that can be the Saturn return. So it's, it's just an intensification of Saturn's influence in your life. And again, if you're investing in your Saturn, it will invest back into you. So I think Cindy, right. you're on the path to <laughs> let it be a pleasant, productive experience. Well, I'm still smiling. So something's oh, yeah. working. You're, you're doing great. Okay, so Vedic says Jupiter in Vedic is the guru, helps Saturn to stay on path of justice. That's that's interesting. I like that. That makes a lot of sense too, where Jupiter is ruling in the ninth house and then Saturn in the tenth. Because I the ninth and the tenth house catch my attention a lot. Um, I have a lot in the ninth house, and it's like the ninth house is like your higher education and philosophy and your individual sense of the truth and your beliefs and like all of that kind of stuff. Like just what, what do you think about the world? Like 
That's a deep question. And the way you will answer it is depending on all of that energy in your ninth house. And the way that you answer it is also fueling and informing what your 10th house is doing. So I think they all like those two, especially the relationship between them is very fascinating to me. The way it's said, and if you study perfection years, which is something completely different, um, it's like we very much are born at our ascending. That's like our starting point. And in the first year of life, we're, we're very much experiencing our first house. And then we turn one, and in our second year of life, we experience our second house. And then we turn two, and in our third year of life, we experience our third house. And it just goes on and on and on. You can Google perfection years, natal charts, and find a little chart where you can like find your age and see what perfection year you're in. And what that means is that it like that's the house that is the themes of this year of your life. And that is so interesting and ties back in the fact that we start at our first house and then our second house and then our third house. And it really is a progression as we learn through the houses. Um, I only very recently learned about perfection years and worked it back about 13 years and they like pretty much all made sense. Sometimes they were like, okay, well, I guess I could see that. Sometimes it was like, yeah, perfect. That was exactly um, what that perfection year would have predicted. Great direction of life. And so Vedic says that the ninth house rules fate and the direction of life, destiny interrelated with career in the 10th, transit so yeah like totally agree like in the ninth house we figure out who we are like who we are in the world who is the world and who are we inside of the world like it's a very big picture comprehensive perspective that we hold in the ninth house when we've successfully you know learned our way through the ninth house and then as we take that understanding out into the world like that's where the 10th house just gets more and more and more successful as we have a clearer idea of what we think of the world and who we are in relationship to the world. What's right and wrong? And how do we define that? Super interesting. So Vedic, what was your connection with Saturn and the eighth house? That question that you asked before. While you're maybe typing that, so Vedic also just said the 10th house I see as house of execution, um, which makes so much sense. And I see it on both the, the 10th, like the top of the wheel and the bottom of the wheel, because the ninth house is where we like learn and establish our truth and define what that is. And then the 10th house is where we go and execute. We make a career, we get a job, we make an impact on the world. And on the bottom of the chart, the third house is where we get a sense of the world around us and we are able to express who we are and what we are about and what we need. We communicate with other people. And like, that's almost like a sense of like talking about it. Like that's, yeah, very much talking and not necessarily acting, but like then you move into the fourth house, you cross over that IC axis and move into the fourth house. And that's very much execution. Like you can talk all day long, but like, you know, it's, it's like the person who goes out and is like this motivational public speaker. And then they come home and their home life is a mess. And like, you can talk all day long, but like if your home isn't full of peace and you're not able to manifest like a nice, gentle, loving home for yourself, all the talk in the world isn't changing that. And same with the ninth house, like you can define your truth, but the 10th house is where you actually bring that to life and like execute on that and turn it into something that the physical world can experience with you. So yeah, there are, act there are houses where we learn about ourselves. There's like introverted houses and then there's extroverted houses where the point is to connect with other people. Um, so yeah, it's super fun to think about like perfection years and like how we grow through like one house after the other and like kind of progress through those. See, I don't know about that. I'll have to look it up. I'll put it on my list of things to look up. 
how Werder defines Mars and Saturn. I'll write that down. Maybe I'll have an answer for you tomorrow morning at the group chart reading, which I was going to put that in here. Um, and then I didn't because I'm taking a tiny hiatus uh, at the beginning of April. So I'll do my Wednesday chart reading tomorrow morning, the 31st, and then the next one won't be until the 14th. So I'll take one Wednesday off, I guess. Um, but otherwise, I'm planning to continue doing those, the Wednesday morning chart readings. Everyone is welcome to come as many times as you want and get a free 10 to 15 minute reading on your natal chart. The goal of those is to continue to teach people how to do their own research because there is a wealth of information that you can learn in your natal chart. Um, real quick, I am going to grab the link for my YouTube channel because that is where the recordings of these sessions go. Um, and if you missed Astro Beginners 1 through 3, you can definitely find those here. Actually, now that I say that, I don't think I recorded the very first one, but the, the other two are definitely on there, along with some other things that I fool around with. Um, and I will upload the recording to my YouTube channel later this evening, and so that'll be on there as well. Um, and yeah, are there any final questions to, to wrap us up? We have one minute left. Carly? Yeah. Um, I don't see the session tomorrow on the meetup. Interesting. Yeah, I can see it on there. Hmm, maybe. Let me see. Let me look real quick, because I think what I might have done is give myself tomorrow off also. <laughs> and you know what? I think I'm going to go for it and just say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take two Wednesdays off. For you. And I'll, Good for you. I'll be back on the 14th. So yeah, let's do that. Um, And yeah, in the meantime, I have, like I said, a few sessions on my YouTube channel that you're welcome to check out. I also do a podcast. And even though I'm not working during these couple weeks, I probably will still be making podcast episodes. I really enjoy doing that. Um, and otherwise, I will see everybody back the week of April 10th, that Saturday. That's when Astro 101 is. Um, so that'll be like a high level intro how to start with your natal chart kind of session. Um, so April 10th, I'll be back and ready for more sessions after some nice hyper Enjoy your time off. Yes, it was so good to see everybody before I go dark for just a moment. So yeah, thank yeah. you so much for being here. Awesome. Mm. Enjoy your break, thank you. I certainly will. We'll see everybody later, thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye.